Good evening. Good to see everyone out. Jerry Jr. is here with us from Michigan. Give us a report on their uh, work up there. He said the weather up there is just like it is down here for now. But he said the snow they got won't melt. <laughs> <laughs> till spring. <laughs> so good to have him here tonight. Always great to see him. Uh, remember the men's breakfast Saturday the 19th at 7 a.m. at Johnny's. If you're uh, going to be able to go, let Adam know uh, if you can make that. And then uh, next Sunday uh, after the morning worship, we'll have a wedding shower for Joe and Gilly. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet for food uh, on the uh, bulletin board out front, so uh, be sure and see that. And then uh, next Sunday night, we'll have our card ministry after our evening worship on that also. Some uh, updates. Uh, Norma's sister, Margaret, that was in the hospital, uh, she said that she's stable. She's got pneumonia and kidney infection, so uh, need to remember her. And Carl is able to be here with us tonight. He was a little dehydrated, and they got him back on his feet and ready to go on that. And then uh, Donna Bovine's brother, we announced this morning, Mike, he was rushed to the ER and said he may have had a blood clot. I haven't heard any updates from them on that. Is anybody else on that? Okay. And... Uh, and then Wilford said his sister uh, said it's in hospice care. He said it's just a matter of time for her and just requested prayers for her comfort on that. Those are the updates I have. Does anybody else have anything? No, I didn't. Continue to remember Pauletta also. Anything else? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity we have to assemble here. We are thankful that uh, we can assemble with brothers and sisters in Christ and we can lift up prayers for many that are on our prayer list. Uh, some that are on the end stages of their life. Uh, we have newborn babies to be thankful for. We have others who are in the hospital and, and going to various facilities. We pray for each of those and, and for the people attending to them. We, uh, we're thankful for the way you bless our lives and for the way you put people in contact with us and us in other people's lives. We pray that we can be an example that you would have us to be to others around and Tonight, we look forward to hearing from Brother Jerry for the, the work he's doing in, in Michigan. We pray for all of the uh, men that we support across the country and, uh, and for the preachers worldwide who are, who are spreading your word. As we lift our voices in song again this evening, we pray that uh, we, uh, we do so cheerfully. Again, thank you for blessing us, thanking you for being with us through this evening, and we look forward to the message that Jerry has for us. This evening, in Christ's name, amen. Start out with 213 tonight, 213. <laughs> I think I left my pitch pipe in here. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and sing uh, um, all three verses.
He took my burdens all away up to a brighter day. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. In my heart joy bells ring. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. A wonderful song he is to me. Brighter the way grows every day. Walking the heavenly way, he gave me a song. A wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. Praises to him, my King. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name, he is my king, a wonderful song he is to me. I am redeemed no more to die, never to say goodbye, he gave me a song, a wonderful song. On some of these days in that fair land, sing with the chorus, grand. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my king, a wonderful song he is to me. <clears throat> 779 will be my next song, 779. We're going to sing all verses of this one as well. Without him I could do nothing. Without him I surely fail. Without him I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? You can turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. Without him, how lost I would be. Without him, I would be dying. Without him, I'd be enslaved. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? You can turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. Without him, how lost 
Christ I would be. If you want to go ahead and mark the invitation song in your books, that's going to be 655. 655 will be the invitation song. And then before the lesson, we'll sing uh, 209. 209 will be the song for the lesson. <clears throat> My Jesus knows when I am lonely. He knows each pain. He sees each tear. He understands each lonely heartache. He understands because he cares. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. When other friends seem to forget me when skies are dark when hope is gone by faith I feel his arms about me and hear him say you're not alone my Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. Once again, if you would like to mark that invitation song, it'll be 655 655. <sighs> All right, good to see everybody tonight on Sunday night. And uh, man, whenever I come visit, my mind, all the memories and all. And I think it was Nathan Honeycutt. I, we were having a softball game here in town. And Nathan Honeycutt decided to dive for second base, and Buddy, his chin hit the ground, and it just filled that thing. And I mean, blood was just coming out. And uh, he didn't want to quit, but they made him and said, you got to go to the ER, get that thing stitched up, boy. He was competitive, right? He was competitive. Ray Crawford was competitive. So I'm telling you, we got some competitive people around here, so it gives me pressure. God, Mike, i got to do a good job. But uh, honestly, I just lo love to see all you guys. Thanks for having me this evening. And uh, I'll tell you just a little bit real quick before we jump into the lesson, all right? Um, I'm up in Atlanta, Michigan, and uh, us, now that I live in Michigan so long, we always do this little thing here. Have you seen the Pure Michigan ads on TV? And, and here is the Lower Peninsula, and here is the Upper Peninsula, right? And this is the thumb of Michigan. That's Saginaw Bay and Bay City and all that. So that'd be Lake Huron. The other side would be Lake Michigan and the Superior on top. And we live up here where Mackinac Bridge, we're about an hour south of Mackinac Bridge. My best friend actually lives up here in the Upper Peninsula, and he preaches at Sheboygan here at the tip. So he drives 60-something miles Sunday, Wednesday, and still will go down another day of the week visiting. You know, going back and forth, that bridge has like a $4 toll to help maintain that cable suspension bridge, you know. But I'm very blessed to have a network of little churches in northern Michigan that are probably 40, 50, 60 miles apart. We're lucky to have a congregation of the church in each county because they're not all the counties have congregations, but we're very fortunate. And so once a month, the fourth Tuesday of each month, uh, we have a meeting where we'll have just a few members of each church will come gather at the central congregation Gaylord there on Interstate 75. And uh, we might have six or seven churches represented, just one or two people. 
and the singing, just like y'all say. I mean, we belt it out, and we enjoy singing, praising the Lord, and we have prayer requests going all around. And my point is this, God's blessed us, although we're all very small, to have good fellowship, you know, because the Bible says we're supposed to honor the king, fear God or reverence God, and love the brotherhood. So it's very fortunate that we have a brotherhood that we care about each other, and that helps you because them, like uh, Billy was talking about the snow, man, I mean, it can get tough in the winter. You know, we get some long winters, and you don't want to know this, but we average around 120 to 140 inches of snow per winter, and it does melt and blow down. So, I mean, just so you don't feel too bad, I mean, it never gets no more than about that deep. I mean... A couple winters ago, we had a bad winter, and uh, I'm going around this curve on the main highway, and the snow is up to the top of the road sign, and they had to bring loaders out because it gets that wind drift, okay? But on the flat, I mean, if I go out there behind the house on the field and all, I mean, it never gets no more about that, you know. But I have had it so deep that I literally just laid down and just rolled, just rolled, you know. So uh, it's, it's a different life. It's a different way. And the good news, I'm, I'm such a country boy, that, and they're country. We live in the country. That They don't hold it against me. I got this southern accent and country and all that. I'm just fine. And I told him this morning, Dexter, I've kind of lost track. But it's been enough years that uh, I've, I've, I've helped immerse over 40 people since I've been up in northern Michigan. But, you know, some of those people die. Some of those people move away. Some of those people do not keep the faith. So, you know, you got a church that should be 50 and 60 by now, and then we had the COVID thing and all that. So we should be 50 and 60. We're just like the snow. After all the stuff in life shakes you out and sifts it out, and it all settles, you get down to that core group. I'm going to say right now, 25 to 35 core group. Because I'm the one that sets out, we still use those portable communion cups. So I set them out before Sunday every week. And I'm going to put out 25, 30 cups. But on good Sundays now, sometimes we get you know, visitors from downstate and all that, or, or visitors we've been working on through our food pantry, and uh, I'll have to put more cups out. So that's a good day, right, when I have to do that. And uh, let me say to you, some of our old-timers have, have moved to back to their children or passed away. And, and almost half our church now are people that I've helped convert through our food pantry. And we had some of you boys came up there and saw that good work we do. And we never missed a lick during the COVID. I just said, wear gloves and masks, and, and we'll set the food out on box and have them around, drive around the building. And, 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 you know, we just do it goodwill. We love you. We want to help you. Everything's free. And I do a lot of work. It's hard work, but it's good work. It's good work. So God's blessed us. I was going to tell you real quick before I get in my lesson, too. I, the last two fellows I got to baptize not too long ago, this one guy, he's an old-timer, and his nickname's Stout. His name is Richard Stoutenberg. But his nickname's Stout. He used to race motorcycles. I mean, he's got one of these big old long mustaches. He was a rough dude. I met him several years ago, but I made buddies with him. So, lo and behold, one of our members that we got through our food pantry lived down the road from him. Next thing you know, they start bringing Richard to church with them. And, and uh, Ruth's husband hadn't been baptized either, and they could end up being buddies. And uh, come find out, he's lost all weight. He had cancer. He's got cancer. He had, first they found out he had lung cancer. Then they found out he had other cancer, and he's taking treatments and all. So uh, I went over. I've been to his house multiple times. You know, we're, I visit. Those of you that knew me years ago, you know, I visit. I mean, I know everybody's homes and families, and, and all. I believe in that. You make relationships. So I come over to Richard's house, and uh, I said, well, he said, well, let's sit out here at the picnic table. It was a pretty good day, you know, and, uh, and I said, you know, Richard, I said, uh, I've been really worried about you, buddy, and uh, I really appreciate you've been coming and stuff, and I've talked to you before. I said, but now, you know, I heard about this cancer thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you need to be sure you're right with the man upstairs. I think you need to get all your T's crossed and your I's dotted. And I said, have you thought about being baptized? Have your sins washed away? And I'm telling you what, this full-grown man that used to race bikes and everything else, was, 
ex-biker dude. Tears in his eyes. He said, yeah, I've lived a rough life, and I'm, I'm sorry about a lot of stuff I've done. He said, but I know. I know I need to do that. I've been thinking about it. He said, I really do. He said, but I really would like my neighbor, Ruth's husband, Dale, to get baptized when I do because he needs to, too. Okay? Somebody hey, him obeyed the gospel. He's concerned about his buddy's soul, too. How about that? I said, well, I'll tell you what I'm fixing to do. I'm going over to Dale's house right now. I said, I'm going to give you a burden. You talk to that man about this. So, I, you know, I did a little switcheroo, didn't you? Know, I went over to Dale's house. And I said, now, I talked to Richard now. It's, you're, you ain't getting no younger, Dale. You know, it's time for you to get right with the Lord. Now, I'm sure y'all been thinking about being back. He's, well, yeah. I said, well, maybe you need to think about that and talk to Richard. I mean, he's got the chemo stuff and everything else. Now, I'm going to leave this on you. That I got the challenge for you within the next week. Talk to Richard about being bad. <laughs> and they called me up the couple day or two later. They said, yep, yeah, we're ready to go. And, and we like to just write that little lake between your house and ours out there on state land called Deshaw Lake. And it's crystal clear water on Sandy Beach. He said, we'd like to just meet you over there first thing Thursday morning. Man, I mean, I'm, you know me. I'm just like, whoo, I'm going to wind up, ready to go. And I watch that weather, and it just got worse and worse. And it clouded up. It was cold, and it was sleep, uh, not sleeping, but it was misty, and that water's cold. And I'm like, they're going to back out on me, right? I've been praying about it. So Thursday morning, man, you know, I called, and he said, yeah, Jerry, I don't know. It's kind of crummy. And that was Dale. He said, I don't think Richard's going to fill up that. And I said, well. I sure was looking forward to doing this for you boys. I said, but you can't do it for him or for me. You got to do it because you won't be right with God. He said, well, let me call Richard back. Isn't this great? You get these guys working on each other, right? And I said, he said, let me call Richard. And he said, call back. He said, yeah, man, Richard's ready to go. We'll meet you down at 10 o'clock. Easiest thing. You're out there. And I said, boys, because he is a little feeble. I said, let's just walk out there about waist deep and sit down on that sandy bottom. And I'll say what I need to say. And I want y'all just to lay down. And you just lay down there, and then you get back up. I want to make sure you're fully covered in water. That's Dennis, remember that in Vanuatu with that sister Ruth Ernest in that little old freshwater creek? See, that's where I learned that from. You think on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 when they did about 3,000, you don't think they might have done something like that? Walked in people out there in Jordan River and said, y'all want y'all to make a big line? We're going to have somebody stand there between you. We're going to say what we need to say and just lay down in that water. Or you're being buried in a watery grave, and God's going to wash them sins away, buddy. You're going to come out of there white as snow, and there ain't going to be nothing on your record. You're forgiven. That's a good feeling. Any of y'all's ever helped with that, to have somebody come up and be crying and thankful? That's it's good. Uh, before that, now I got to baptize a fellow my age. His name's Matt. His, not Matt Needham. And, uh, and I got to baptize his brother, and I went and studied with them. They live in Hillman, a town about 15 miles from us, and his brother is about five, Brian, five years younger than him. He, he, Matt's my age, and his brother's five years younger, and Matt's the goody boy, and his brother's the mischief boy. Okay, I mean, yeah, I was like, what? Yeah, I'm looking in the mirror. <laughs> so uh, I got to visit them and talk with them and study with them, and guess what, man? I got, I got to immerse both them boys, and they're big boys. Both of them big boys. But Matt has become faithful. He helps us, and it's through the food pantry because he, he wanted to help. He came over and said, can I volunteer because I want to give back. Now, he's so disabled, he used to do carpet, and they dropped a big roll on his back and broke his back years ago. He's got a morphine pump. That's how he lives. His brother has crutches up to his elbows, walks like this right here. And he was in the Marines. I don't know what happened to him. But I'm just going to tell you right now, don't judge people. Don't judge people by what they look like. Them boys are good as gold. And he's been so good, and, but here's what the hardship is. The Lord knows it. We go over there, and his wife Barbara is a sweetheart. And she worked at Walmart the next town over. She never was hardly off on Sunday. So she, but, I, you know, I, I invited her. Barb, we'd like to have you. Your husband would enjoy having his wife come to church with him sometimes. So she finally started coming. She's really loving it and giving me good, encouraging things. Well, one Sunday morning, this was only two or three months ago, he's getting ready for church. He said, Barb, hurry up. You're going to be late. And he went over and shook her foot, and it was cold. So here I got a brand-new Christian brother my age with his younger brother, and his wife had just started coming to church, and she died. She had a heart attack. 
So I'm just, I just want to tell you those personal examples to understand. You got victories and defeats. You got ups and downs. And you got to be careful about judging people. Sometimes the roughest cop person will give you a share off their back, right? All right, now let's get into God's Word. I am going to use a little bit that I did, Dexter, this morning because I like it so much. I, a church called me up recently and said, we'd like you to come give us a three-lesson thing on prayer. Because, again, like I told you, we don't have big churches, but our, our members believe in prayer. But you live up north, and it's hard living all winter, and you depend on the Lord, and you pray, and you believe. You believe he's real, and you believe he has power. And Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So when you pray to God, do you have faith that he has power? Can he answer prayer? He is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay, in Acts 17, Paul had that. He's in Athens, Greece, man, with all those pillars and columns and, and temples to all these pagan gods and goddesses. And finally, there's a little bitty one that said to the unknown God. I always look at communion table. I see that one etched in there, and I think about that altar they had said to the unknown God. He said, this is the one I'm going to talk to you about. Y'all don't know him. He's the true and the living God's made everything. He does not dwell in temples made with hands. He does not depend on anything us humans can give him since he gives to all life and breath. And in him we live and move and have our being. So when you pray, you realize that you're, you're, you're connecting to some powerful deity, spirit, being that can see things and know things and affect your life. I believe it, and I believe he has. In spite of all my struggles and problems, I think God has heard my prayers many, many times. And he don't always answer an affirmative. Sometimes it's no. Sometimes it's maybe. Sometimes it's wait. Later. Sometimes you don't even know what you're asking. It's not good for you. You can't handle it. You'll regret it. But the Bible says God's ways are not our ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways. And so are his thoughts higher than our thoughts. You know, in Genesis 3, here's what I meant this morning. I shared that with him in Bible class. That It talked about Adam and Eve after they ate that fruit and hid. Because they disobeyed God. It said they heard God coming. <coughs> Excuse me. They, I've been hunting like Jeremy and them. I've been hunting. And, and Ricky made me get up at 4.30 in the morning so I could get on that flat bottom boat and go up Current River to go on the other side. I have not recovered yet, Jeremy. <laughs> Two mornings in a row, but I didn't get one, whatever. I just I was blessed to be with the boys and have a good time. And, and you know, Ricky's dad, right? His, I, it was great to visit with him. He's a good man. Well, anyway, I, I think about they heard God coming in the garden, and what would that sound like? I've heard a lot of things. I listen to things. Brian lives out on Strickland Point out there, living by Wapel Lake. Sometimes you can hear flocks of ducks just. <laughs> you can hear the wind rushing from the wings, of even whistles. Think about God. Have you ever been in the weather in some forest and all of a sudden a blast of air hits all them leaves? Again, I was in Bono. No, at Fiji. Dennis was at the motel, and I'm like, I'm going to get out and see something, Fiji. And I met this taxi driver that had a buddy that let him ride horses. I said, I want to go for a horse ride. He said, I'll take you out there. Saddled up three old ragtag horses with Australian saddles. They ain't got no horn. I'm like, oh, no. And we went up, uh, we went through a, a sugar cane plantation across the river, saw a mongoose down there in the roots, and went up on this sleeping giant mountain. And the higher we got, the more winds come off the Pacific Ocean with all those blooming flowers and giant green leaves and that air rushing. And you could just see waves of it. And I just thought Adam and Eve walking in the garden, hearing God. They hear him coming. And they hid. How would that sound? I don't know. It's, it's amazing to contemplate. But see, they did something they knew he didn't approve of. So now they feel guilty. So now they're hiding. And he calls them out. He calls them on the carpet. Because, you know, God, we're transparent to God. You don't hide from God. 
In Psalm 139, David said, I go to the highest mountain, Lord, you're there. I go to the deepest part of the ocean, Lord, you're there. I go to the darkest place of dark. Your light shines in that darkness, God, even, you're there. So we deal with that. In Psalm 51, he said, my sin is ever before me because he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and then he had the note sent by her husband to get killed on the front lines. David had a lot of guilt. He took another man's wife, then he covered it up, and then she got pregnant, lost a baby. I mean, it's terrible. He wanted to build a temple. God said, I'm not going to let you build a temple. You've been a bloody king to me. But when it was all said and done, he said, he is a man after my own heart. It gives me hope. With all the mistakes David made, he still was a man after God's own heart because God knew David's heart. You read the book of Psalms. That's from David. The Lord is my shepherd. And what did he say in Psalm 51 after he said, my sins ever before me? He said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And then I'll teach sinners the error of their way or transgressors the error of their way. And sinners will be converted to you. So sometimes sometimes we got too many skeletons in the closet, man. Sometimes we got too many cobwebs in in the corners of the rooms. We need to sleep out the cobwebs and clean out the closets and just lay it out to God. So Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden for their disobedience, and I think we deal with stuff too. You know, their son Cain killed his brother Abel. I mean, how about that? Your first two sons. And God confronted Cain about it and asked him to straighten up. But the next day he went and got his brother and, and, and slew him. Was that heartbreaking for the parents? Because then God drove Cain out and gave him a curse, didn't he? But then they had Seth in Genesis 4, 25, 26. Seth also then had a son that was their grandchild and named him Enosh. It says, at that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. And I want to say to you, the Bible was, Moses wrote about 3,650 years ago. But he wrote about things from way back in the very beginning, thousands of years more. And the Bible is compiled of 40 different writers of different periods but they're all writing during their contemporaries, and they're witnesses of many things, and they have witnesses that, have, that t- can collaborate or critique what they did, and yet it survived all these centuries because the people they're living real. It's amazing. And so from the time of Adam and Eve's grandchildren, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord before the flood, and he said it's a man that walked with God. I'm sure Noah called the name of the Lord. You know, after you've been in the ark for all that months with all them smelly animals and rocking on that water, if you ever get seasick, don't you know he was glad? First thing he did, buddy, jumped off that ark. I think I'd have kissed the ground. He didn't. It didn't say he kissed the ground. I think I would have. But he made an altar, and he made an offering to God. And it said that's when it started having rainbows in the sky to remind us God made a promise. I'll never... Destroy the whole world again by a flood. As long as the earth remains, that might be a catch there too. As long as it remains. There will be, right, seed time and harvest. Summer and winter. Abraham, he made altars, called on the name of the Lord. Abram, Isaac, he called on the name of the Lord. Jacob, he had the, he made a stone for a pillow one night. Had a vision, a dream that angels were ascending and descending a ladder. And he woke up next morning and said, oh, oh, this, surely, this must be hallowed ground. The Lord must be in this place. He built an altar using that rock that he had used for a pillar and made an offer. Uh, 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 he made an offer to God. He said, God, if you're going to be with me, if you'll be with me, you're going to be my God and I'm going to be faithful to you. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? This is God's word that tells me the story that becomes Judaism, the Hebrews, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? Jacob changed to Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. And then it comes finally to the New Testament. And I mean, we're talking about history, folks. We're talking about the, the Syrians, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians. Go read the book of Daniel. Daniel lived during all those different kings. Cyrus the Persian had the great, oh my goodness, having that great battle right with the Greeks. Those guys were jealous of Daniel, by the way. He was a Jew in captivity, and they knew he was a righteous man. And they said uh, the king had elevated, elevated him to be like maybe second in power of the kingdom. 
And they said, the only way we can bring this man down is by his own religion. Say, so talk Nebuchadnezzar and them, or, or I'm sorry, Darius to me, in a making a proclamation that no man could pray except to him. So, so there's always been world leaders that would get the God complex and end up feeling like they're worthy of worship. Well, how do us people that really believe in God and follow him, how do we re respond to that, to a leader that's got a God complex? So Daniel, he was a good man. He was a Quick as he heard about that 30-day decree, he went home and opened his windows facing Jerusalem. And he prayed. Because he prayed three times a day. And you know what? He got thrown into a den of lions over that, didn't he? Threw him in a den of lions over it. Even the king was upset about it. He said, I, I wish I could save you from this. And he stayed up all night. He couldn't sleep. He's worried about Daniel. But the Bible says that God, an angel, he sent an angel down there and stopped the mouths of the lions. So they did not even put a scratch on Daniel. Do we have a living God? Who has, do we have a God that has the power to answer prayers? Yes or no? Are you going to throw out anything to God that surprises him? Are you going to throw out anything to God? And he's going to say, whoa, I ain't heard that one, man. Let me check with my administration. I don't know if we can handle that or not. Yeah, the Bible says if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Romans 8 says we're more than conquerors through him. And Philippians 4.13 says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I'm watching oof, the clock here and all my wonderful notes. Because I did this thing for that prayer, and I mean, I got all kinds of things about prayer. I think about the Old Testament characters, though, see, besides Daniel. How about Elijah on Mount Carmel against those 450 false prophets in 1 Kings 18? And they cried out all morning to their false gods, and finally he just did a little two-sentence prayer. God, would you please have regard to my offering and prove to these people that you're the real, true, living God? And all, <laughs> they put water. They had a trench around that fire. They had all the offering and everything, and all these false guys were cutting themselves and crying. And, and he mocked them. He was cocky, man, Elijah. Oh, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe you need to go a little out and wake him up. Maybe, maybe he's off on vacation or something and everything. And he did his little short prayer, and, and fire came from heaven. I wonder if it's like lightning, maybe, a uh, lightning bolt. How much power does a bolt of lightning have? Now you had this erect altar, and now in like a second, it just whoo, flat ground. They all, whoa, they all repented and started asking for forgiveness, whatever. And, I mean, he cleaned house, didn't he? And Ahab and Jezebel got mad at him, didn't they? Jezebel said, as these prophets of mine are today, so will you be tomorrow. He took off across the desert and went up in the mountain. You know, we went over there, right, to, over there, <laughs> Shannon County. I mean, it's like mountains by Current River, two, three hundred foot cliffs. And I think about Elijah, boy, boogity, boogity, boogity across that desert. And he gets up in that mountain and everything. He's, oh, God, I'm the only one left. And, he, and finally, man, there's, right, it's shaking. There's smoke and fire and everything. And finally, small little quiet voices I've got 7,000 in Israel Elijah have not bowed the knee to Baal you just be faithful you just get busy and then he had the gold chair at all he's a busy boy go back to Ahab and all that or run the Bible tells me in James 5 the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth or accomplishes much and I remind people, it's not because you're so righteous and you're so good in yourself that makes prayer so great. It's because of who you're praying to. Because he's so great. That's what makes it great. And James referred to, he said, remember Elijah. He prayed that it wouldn't rain and God caused a drought. He prayed that it would rain after that little thing on Mount Carmel. And then God, there was a cloud in the shape of a hand that was coming across into the drought. Hezekiah, man, Isaiah 37, I love. Now that actually, we have three accounts of that because by then the Jews had become unfaithful and the Assyrians had come down to conquer them and surround Jerusalem. And I mean, it was so bad that this, these women were fighting over who gets to eat the baby. 
How bad is that? One woman said, well, you can eat my baby today, and then I will eat yours tomorrow. She reneged the second one. That was a bad trick, wasn't it? Ate the first one, and then she wouldn't let her do. She could take the king. Well, then uh, Sennacherib sent a messenger, the Rabshakeh, gave a message to the Jews, said, don't think your God's going to be able to stop us. We have rolled over nation after nation and destroyed their gods. Don't let Hezekiah and them talk you into believing that your God's going to save you. We're going to do you just like everybody else. Hezekiah grabbed that parchment, and it wasn't really kosher for kings of the tribe of Judah to go into the priest domain of the temple who were Levites, but he did. He went in their temple, and he spread that letter out, and he said, God, do you see this? Do you hear what he's saying about you? Please, Lord, please save us. Please prove to the Assyrians that you are the real living God. Did God answer that prayer or not? In the affirmative. The next morning, they said when they woke up, there was 185,000 dead Assyrians all around that city. The Bible says God sent an angel of the Lord's army. He didn't send angels. He didn't send legions. He sent the angel one. And that fellow took care of 185,000. Sennacherib's like, hmm, maybe we need to go back to Nineveh and Assyria. It's time to go home. He all, all of a sudden encountered the real God. Amen? He could bluff everybody else and roll over them, but he wasn't rolling over Jehovah. He got rolled over. So, I mean, I could do all them different examples. See, I want to encourage you to go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John on your own personal time, your red-letter Bibles, and let God's Son Jesus tell you about prayer. It's not supposed to be hypocritical. You're not supposed to be making a big show out of it. You're supposed to even be willing to pray for your enemies. Our Father who art in heaven, you're supposed to praise God the Father, and you're able to ask him for, give us this day our daily bread. Do you worry about having food in your cupboard? That's okay. Jesus said, pray about it. Do you have temptations? It's okay to pray about that. Deliver us from temptation, right? Jesus taught me about all that. And there's an acrostic called pray, P-R-A-Y, pray, praise. First of all, you should praise the one that you're appealing to. You praise him, our Father who art in heaven. The Jews were jealous with Jesus because he would call God his Father. But he taught us to call him. And the, the Aramaic word they use is Abba, which means Daddy. And they just thought that was sacrilegious for a human being to feel like God is really their daddy. And that's really what Jesus is challenging us when he said the Lord teaches us to pray. The challenge is that you will go to God and get a relationship to some point, someday, that you really do feel. Because he said, don't call man father on earth like we know one religion that has to address leaders as our holy father and kiss their ring. You call God father, Amen. Praise, R, repent. We can't be holier than thou and arrogant and proud when we approach God and expect to be heard. He said, you can't pray to my father. Jesus said this. You can't pray to my father asking for forgiveness if you ain't willing to forgive your fellow man. So you have to be willing to be apologize for the sinful bad things you've done in your life. Say, I know I need to be better, God. I'm, I'm just an old heel. I'm not worth the effort, really, but I'm, I'm come crawling to you. And Jesus in Luke 18 gave the example of the Pharisee that went to the temple and prayed and the sinner. Pharisee, oh, God, I thank you that I'm not all this. I'm not like other men, and I tithe everything I got, and I'm so holy and all that. And it said the sinner was so humble. He wouldn't even look to heaven. He smote his breast. And he had a one-sentence prayer. God, forgive me, a sinner. Jesus said, which man went down to his house justified that day? He said, I'm going to tell you, it was the sinner. Amen? It was the sinner. Because he repented. And he was real. I think we're full of hypocrisy in this society, aren't we? 
I don't want no hypocrisy. Don't play no games with God. You're transparent. Just repent. So praise him. Repent. Hey, now you're in the frame of mind to ask. And you really, you can ask God about anything that concerns you in your life. Right? Philippians 4, 6 following. Be careful or be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So he's saying there, you still need to be thankful for your blessings. So, you know, you're not just, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, God. And he's going to say, you little brat, no way. You know, I mean, that's the way I am with my kids. You know, give me, give me, give me. I said, you're doing this. You need to do that. I'll kick you in the butt. Okay, whatever. I hope God doesn't say that. I imagine if God kicked you, you'd be, whoo, maybe over in Hawaii or something. That'd be a good place to land. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Ask. Why do I say ask? Because Jesus' Sermon on the Mount said these three things. He said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. I'm going to go back to that one. The last one, P-R-A-Y, is yield. Do you know what a yield sign means on this little roustabout? Right? Some guy coming around there and you see him, then you've got to slow down and yield. You can, I've got a bigger truck than he does, I'm going. Okay, let's have a fender bender and have about $15,000 body repair bill. Yield, man. Yield. Was Jesus willing to yield before he got crucified in the garden? He took Peter, James, and John. He said, please watch and pray. And they couldn't understand why he was so distraught. He went in there a little farther. And he's down there on his hands and knees, I think. He was knelt down, I think. He it said he's sweating great drops like as of blood. And he's like, Father, could you let this cup pass from me? Meaning, can you let, can you avoid me having to be nailed on a cross? Whipped and beat, mocked and bleed and pain and suffering until I run out of breath, die? Nevertheless, he didn't stop there in that prayer, did he? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Was Jesus willing to yield to God? Yes, Jesus was. I'm going to have two verses to end before I end here tonight. One is the book of Hebrews. Let me see. I, I wrote it down. It says he learned through his suffering. Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And so none of us should think we're above having difficulties or struggles in life. None of us should think that we're above Jesus. Did God let Jesus go through a lot of pain and anguish? But did Jesus yield to the Father's will? Yes, he did. So P-R-A-Y, praise, repent, ask, but yield. Yield. So when you pray, James 4 said, don't be making plans, say, just going to do this, that, and the other, maybe all your head. He said, instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will do that. Amen? If the Lord wills. So I'm going to end with this verse tonight. In Revelation 3.20, and Jesus was actually addressing the seven churches of Asia. Five had problems. Only two really were pretty hunky-dory where he bragged on them a little bit. Five had some real big struggles, even in danger of losing their status as a church. He said, I might... Just remove your candlestick if you don't repent. So that, I count that out. That's about 75%, 78%. I mean, we have a 78% chance that we're members of congregations that pro may have blaring faults when it comes to being the kind of church God wants us to be. So do we need to be humble, folks? Do we need to be willing to yield? But I'm going to tell you what happens when you yield. In Revelation 3, verse 20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open, I will come in with him and sup. There is no better fellowship than when you visit with people and eat a meal with them and just share, spend time. That is close fellowship. 
and we're all so busy that we're doing less and less of that, ain't we? Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open that door, I will come in to him and sup. There's hope for you tonight. No matter how bad you've been, no matter how much you've messed up, even if you've been angry and blame God, if you would repent and be willing to open that door, Jesus could come in. Do you need Jesus in your life? You better, you better believe you need Jesus in your life. When you die, you have no power of yourself to resurrect yourself, no way. All these millionaires doing that stupid cryogenic freezing, somebody's getting rich, aren't they? Doing the refrigeration systems on those bodies that are dead. But the Bible teaches that there is a soul or a spirit in humans that transcends the grave. And the only way you're going to be in a good way is if it's through Jesus. The only way you're going to make it is piggyback the Son of God. And the reason I say that is the poster tracks in the sand. A man's life was a record of these tracks in the sand. He said, God, I see you was with me in my life, but sometimes there's just one set of footprints. Why did you leave me at the hardest time of my life? He said, that's when I piggybacked you. That's why I carried you on my shoulders. Do you need to follow Jesus? Do you need to be a Christian? Do you need forgiveness? Do you need a clean slate? Would you like to have hope that someday, even though you died, that you'll be in a good spiritual way? I think the Bible gives us answers to that, and I believe that's a good way to live. So Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me daily. Or come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Or I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. Or finally, John 17, this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I hope you know God. He knows you. Have you obeyed the gospel? We'll give you that opportunity tonight to end this lesson as we stand and sing. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste, oh haste to its spring. Tis the fountain of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a living stream with a crystal gleam from the open for all. There's a rock that's cleft and no soul is left that may not its pure water share. Tis for you and me and it
wretched stream I see, let us hasten joyfully there. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. <clears throat> hey, I, I want to give y'all a joke about prayer. Y'all know what Before daylight fell off a cliff, hanging by a thing, God, God, please save me, please save me. God says, Do you really trust me? Yes, God, yes. You turn loose. <laughs> God, somebody else, somebody else, help me. And it got daylight, there was an old age about two or three feet below him. He just kicked me back. <laughs> If you uh, if you weren't able to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, you can go to the door on my left, and uh, Dennis will help you out with that. Um, we'll sing 387 uh, one time through, and then we will have our closing prayer tonight. <clears throat> Lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find their way. Few there are who seem to care and few there are who pray. Friends of heart and fill my life, give me one soul today. Let's pray together. Holy and righteous Father who art in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this wonderful day you give us and for the opportunity that we've had to be here, Lord, to hear your word proclaimed. And we're so thankful for men like Brother Robinson that come to us and proclaim his word in a manner that he does. We pray, Father, that you'll continue to be with him, continue to watch over him, especially as they travel. To, uh, whenever they travel, Lord, we pray that you'll give them a safe trip that they can return home, Lord, and continue to watch over him. Lord, we're especially mindful tonight of those unable to be with us on account of sickness. We know, Lord, that there was few mentioned in our bulletin. We pray that you'll continue to be with them. Continue, Father, to give them the health that they need where they can be back again with us. And, Lord, we're thankful so much for Jesus and what he means to each and every one of us. Thank you so much for the forgiveness of sin, Father, if we could accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. Be with us always, Lord. Continue to watch over each one of us. Be with their families, Lord. Keep us in good health. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.